uh, in September I think um, so it's not possible um, anyways um, we're gonna be starting today on a very interesting topic um, so so far now that you have studied so much about um, human psychology um, how we are different from each other how we are similar to each other um, our personalities um, and then we saw the impact of intelligence and IQ uh, we also had a debate about um, why are we the way that we are does it depend on our um, genetical um, inheritance um, we take everything from our parents um, or our environments actually impact our bodies um, in our thinking um, we also know that there are two types of differences that we have one is the genotype that comes uh, we inherit from our parents another is the environmental impacts on our bodies and our personalities um, and that is known as the phenotype um, in the beginning we also studied about the perceptual fallacies um, and illusions that we have I, mean, I told yesterday also that all tendons is uh, being marked by the CR and the GR so please contact them for your attendance um, we also had different assignments in which you had to make your genogram uh, about the uh, diseases that um, run in your um, family and how that can possibly impact you and what you can do to make sure that you do not have the same ones um, we also studied briefly about the, the impacts of these things on your careers um, and how IQ actually moderates your decision um, in choosing a career for yourself um, yesterday we delved deep into um, workings of um, human brain and our mechanisms to make sure that there is no cognitive dissonance between our ideal world and our real world um, how we actually match these two opposite um, ends of the spectrum in our human personality and make it more acceptable in terms of um, our um, society um, how we assimilate into other people's expectations of us and how we actually create expectations for other people to comply and if this compliance is done properly then we um, call people very um, well adjusted but if it's not we look of uh, we think we think of them as uh, maladjusted uh, people who do not belong into a society or certainly they are very awkward they do not know how to um, function in a society um, depending on uh, I mean, we match them with standards that we have set for uh, proper behavior and if they do not behave in the way that they're supposed to behave or everyone else in the society behaves then we think of them as deviants um, or rebels now um, it's, it's a very controversial debate how we actually treat rebels and, and we're going to be slightly talking about uh, more of a serious rebellion today um, and that is um, psychopathology so what it actually means is that why do we think that people who are different from us um, or a majority in the society or actually are expressing their frustration and anger um, about uh, the norms in society how do we actually deal with them and what are the common ways of um, expressing that now an interesting case is that oh sure I can zoom the picture Aisha all right perfect um, so that's an interesting um, case to begin our lecture with um, and that's something that um, happened in um, some uh, at some point in 18th um, century uh, where people who had different emotions uh, emotional reactions to different situations and they were out of control um, so doctors uh, back in those days had no scientific means to actually evaluate what's going on um, in people's brain they think of them as mad people um, who need some <laughs> drastic treatment uh, in order to behave like normal people um, and they did not have any CT scans or PET scans um, or MRIs back then so they have 
they would have no reason to actually think that there there's something uh, going on um, and that would require medical attention uh, the medical science had not gotten to the point where uh, we could think of mental illnesses as um, genetic ones or um, extreme expression of uh, normal common behaviors and emotions now what they did is that you know if you look at the picture um, to instead of uh, thinking of that as a medical problem what they did is that they thought that it's some sort of uh, brain dysfunction in which uh, people cannot control their emotions uh, so what they did is that um, they would use a tool like a very pointy tool um, and they would insert that um, in f right below your eyelid um, to the point that um, they would drill two holes um, in your skull both on the left and the right side uh, and I'm pretty sure you understand um, the prefrontal cortex we studied that in the neuroanatomy uh, lecture I think it was three four weeks ago um, so you see the frontal area uh, where doctors actually believed all the um, hysteria and uh, psychological behavior came from uh, was the reason that people are behaving out of um, character so they inserted this um, long uh, sharp tool um, and drilled two holes and they believed that you know um, all the neurotransmitters inside that brain you know if you drain them out um, then people will start uh, behaving in a better way um, according to the literature um, it's called prefrontal lobotomy and in a lobotomy doctors severed neural connections between the brain's prefrontal area and the rest of the brain fibers believed by practitioners to promote excessive emotions so if there's a patient who is excessively active you know he's screaming he's yelling he cannot be put to control so people thought that you know it's some kind of voodoo magic um, or brain disorder and there's a requirement that you have to sever uh, the frontal part from the actual brain uh, in order to make it better um, there are two common procedures for doing that one was the standard and other the transorbital lobotomies and we do not actually have to go in detail to do that um, exactly Amara you know it's it's very scary procedure you know um, um, the reason for actually telling you that is that you know how far we have come in medical science to actually understand people's emotions and behaviors and do something about that so that people can um, survive and live a normal life and um, now that we have brain surgery and um, psychiatry um, so many things that we used to think of um, as magic uh, or spell uh, or um, bad demons and ghosts and now we understand there is a scientific reason behind that um, and uh, we should be very thankful for the advancement in science that we understand our normal behaviors unfortunately it's very common um, these days even in Pakistan especially in remote areas and villages people think that um, if someone has an epilepsy attack um, or someone has seizures um, they're not normal people um, we now understand that epilepsy is um, a condition which has um, no certain origin um, it can happen to anyone um, there are no specific risk factors and that would actually make you more predisposed to um, having epilepsy attack and there are so many uh, famous intellectual intelligent people um, who have um, epilepsy uh, one of them uh, was Stephen Hawking himself um, and these things do not actually um, hinder you from doing anything um, they do not stop you from achieving anything in life um, and I think that's pretty evident from the great scientists life um, so but now we know that you know it's something um, that should be um, taken as part of the life and um, people who do have um, certain um, extreme expressions of extreme behaviors um, they are just like normal people except you know there's some parts of their lives and that would need more attention than the others um, so speaking of that um, let's look at a video uh, about um, psychopathologies and how uh, they came into being uh, and then we can go on forward and see what do we actually do about that how do we cluster different 
psychological disorders in different ways um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share the uh, video for you and for other people uh, who might not be able to watch it I'm uh, pasting the link here all right then um, so now that you have um, a fair idea of how psychopathologists look like, how we used to think about them, um, how people are actually treated in these um, psychiatric wards, um, let's get to the part where we actually um, learn on how do we actually diagnose um, these problems. Um, because frankly speaking, all of us have that. You know, Some people have that on one spectrum, other people have on the other. But how do we find that um, who's normal and who's not? And that's certainly for uh, a psychologist or a psychiatrist um, to decide. Um, but generally what happens is that if you're behaving in a certain manner that's actually disrupting your own and other people's lives, um, then that is the point where we would be concerned about um, your mental health. Now, um, just b to be clear, um, please note that before you would actually suspect a mental um, health problem, you have to think very deeply if you have any medical problems that are actually causing this um, issue. For example, sometimes people cannot speak, um, sorry, sleep. Um, they have, they think they have insomnia, they have some um, um, stressors or anxiety that's not making them sleep. And, and the only fact is that, that they have eaten way too much at night. Um, and that's um, radiating gases in your, their stomach and you know, um, that makes them restless and they cannot s sleep um, and that is um, a medical and physical problem it has nothing to do with mental um, illness so before you suspect of a mental um, illness you know you should probably make sure that um, there's nothing going on in your body that actually um, is expressing itself um, in um, psychological discomfort now um, I have shared a link uh, for a presentation um, in um, on my course page um, and also um, it's in the file that I'll be uploading on in Google Classroom about uh, the notes. Uh, let me go ahead and share it to let you know what are the basic categories of psychological diseases um, and how do we actually define them. Um, Sanya, it could be, but there are like 1,000 more reasons that that can happen. Um, so unless someone has actually um, evaluated the patient um, deeply and carefully and taken tests, um, they will not be sure that your insomnia is because of your uh, depression and anxiety. Um, sometimes it's not at all. Sometimes there are other um, reasons for that. Um, yes, overthinking can do that. Um, the amount of um, mental activity um, if it increases especially in introverts um, if it becomes uh, too high or you have consumed and uh, coffee or tea late at night or in the evening um, then it can interfere with your uh, mental activity and you're not able to simply go to sleep this is why it's recommended before going to sleep two hours before sleep you turn off your phone and dim the lights and do not do something exciting or watch a movie or something because then you would be thinking about that um, and that's true especially for extra worse and then you will have problems sleeping um, so can everyone see the screen the presentation all right um, so this is um, we're going to be studying about something called uh, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 5 that actually psychologists use to categorize people into different um, personality disorders based on where they lie. Um, but before we go to that, um, I'll tell you two ways in which you can diagnose people. One is um, the nomothetic approach, uh, which it means that um, these psychological tests actually evaluate you and compare you with same people of your age um, and, and same country. Uh, for example, you take the big five test 
and what it did is that it took all your answers and compared you with the average uh, person of your age group um, in your country and told you that based on this average are you above average or below average um, across five domains and you remember those five domains were um, openness conscientiousness extraversion agreeableness and neuroticism um, and in the end it actually scored you based on your answers um, with this sample group now this approach that actually compares you with other people it's called the nomothetic approach and uh, i think we've already studied about that um, in the personality psychology lecture and that the same thing applies in the clinical psychology also now the other uh, way to classify people um, that they generally use and by the way meeting time is almost over so all right so uh, we were discussing about um, how do we actually um, know that people um, are normal and, pe and other people are not. So one way of looking at that is that they compare um, you with other people of the same age and same place. And that, uh, well, that is the nomothetic approach of psychodiagnostic. And the other approach is that um, everyone um, is a unique individual and you have to describe their personality in detail and uh, make a sketch of personality and take notes um, that psychologists often do and then based on those notes you can categorize people into different personality disorders um, so the uh, diagnostic and statistical manual 5 which is the fifth version um, is the manual that psychologists use uh, to um, categorize people with mental illnesses into one of the personality disorder clusters so there are three major clusters cluster A, B, and C. And we're going to be looking at them um, in a short uh, moment. For now, um, just for you to understand uh, the basic concept, um, I want to give you a very basic um, criteria for how you can possibly um, find out um, the mental health um, issues um, of course one way is to um, look at the symptoms um, of the disorder and then you can um, identify based on your prior knowledge that what personality disorders people can have um, but in another um, way which is um, the new theory uh, that based on your big five scores uh, you can actually see that um, are you an introvert or an extrovert um, now, based on if you're an introvert or an extrovert, they're possible. Now, remember the words, there's possible or probable um, uh, disorders that you are predisposed to, but it does not mean that you have this uh, disorder. You can be absolutely normal. Um, but uh, based on literature and, and statistics that we have, generally, um, on average, people um, who are introverts, they are more disposed to uh, internalizing disorders uh, what it means is that um, you would have uh, you would tend to actually think of um, situations uh, as your own fault or find the answers within yourself um, so you do not actually go out and um, seek help from other people instead of you know finding answers on your own uh, is uh, the first thing that uh, people generally do if they are categorized um, as um, introverts. Now, um, general um, issues with the introverts are normally, on average, anxiety, depression, um, paranoia, um, and these kind of um, issues. Now, on the extrovert spectrum, uh, people generally have uh, the borderline personality disorder um, and we're going to be studying soon uh, what that actually means um, and then you have um, the bipolar disorder that's extreme mood variations um, you can also have uh, narcissistic disorder um, that's an extreme um, appreciation of yourself and thinking of yourself as the best um, so these are some of the disorders um, that you might have based on your strategy um, of internalizing or externalizing the problems um, in life. Now, um, how do we actually access that? Before we actually get to the definitions of cluster A, B, and C, 
um, let's talk a little bit about um, the tool that we have to do you all see the new page with this graph okay um, so if you have ever been to a um, psychological ward or if you haven't been evaluated for mental health uh, for any issue at all um, you probably uh, would be given a test if the psychologist suspect um, that um, there is something wrong and you need you should be taking a test and the most common test for evaluating um, your psychological well-being um, is called the MMPI 2 which is the abbreviation of Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory Tool. Um, it's just like a test like this big five uh, and there are a f it's a very long test um, it has 567 questions uh, and these are true or false questions so you s read a statement and then you choose the best response for that uh, true um, or false now MMPI 2 is the second version of that and the newer latest version is MMPI 2 RF that's um, the revised version of that um, that was published in 2008 and the shorter version is 338 questions and the longer version is 567 questions um, most people actually complete that in 40 to 50 minutes um, and then based on your answers um, this is the kind of graph that you get now I'll not get into uh, deep complexities complexities of um, how to evaluate that but in generally uh, what it does is that um, um, it gives you a graph of your peaks peak scores and the lowest scores um, on different personality disorders uh, according to the D uh, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual version 5 there are uh, 10 basic uh, personality disorders uh, divided into uh, three clusters that you can um, possibly have and it gives you different scores um, if you see these two lines the horizontal lines all the scores in between um, are in the normal range so that means if you are if your uh, peak scores are within the normal range that there is no reason to suspect that there is a mental disorder but if there are peaks um, that is that might suggest that you know you are out of the normal range uh, but th there are so many other factors that you have to equate in before you can actually uh, predict that um, or establish that there is something going on um, now it also has a lie scale um, so this test is very good at finding out if you have lied on some of the um, items uh, because it cross compares um, your questions um, in different uh, ways it will ask you multiple questions in multiple ways uh, it will also tell you um, how you're trying to portray yourself in a better light or in a worse light they have different scales for that also but the point of um, the exercise is to tell you that there are different um, uh, ways to evaluate your responses now let's get to the uh, three clusters or three personality diso um, personality disorder and groups that people can be divided into so here we go so do you see the new screen all right I'm gonna go ahead and actually zoom that so everyone can see that okay so these are generally um, the three uh, big clusters um, it's obvious to state that you know not all personality disorders are uh, present there there are so many of them and you know di diagnostic and statistical manual 5 has um, a complete exhaustive list of them but these are uh, the most um, referred to uh, clusters when treating for a uh, um, psychopathology um, so if you look at the first cluster uh, cluster A it's marked um, by focus on people's behavior and that can be categorized into odd and eccentric so you have probably uh, witnessed it yourself um, or seen that in the movies um, or ge in general in society that there are some people who are very odd they're very eccentric um, we might think of them as weird uh, we can think of them as not fitting in the society they're different now remember again I told you that 
personalities are on a spectrum of uh, it's just like a rainbow so there's no good or no bad color it's just like different from others or the majority um, and the MMPI is a nomothetic test that compares you with everyone else um, so in comparison with average people if someone is odd or eccentric then they can be categorized um, in cluster A if their expression is very um, extreme so the three personality disorders in this uh, uh, cluster um, actually are the paranoid personality now I cannot go into detail for all the disorders but I can briefly explain it to you what they are so the paranoia is actually um, an extreme uh, fear or and let's say uh, unfounded fear um, of bad things happening to you um, so you're always uh, afraid of new things new people um, unsafe situations um, that can be and all of these disorders by the way have different reasons some could be genetically transferred other could be environmental reasons for that um, and then there could be your personal life experiences that might um, you know increase your predisposition to these diseases um, and so, so do you you cannot really establish that you will if you will have that but um, if you have that these are the common signs um, that you would have um, if you have a paranoia disease uh, wait a minute let me just go ahead and turn off the annotation all right and then we have schizoid uh, personality disorder um, schizoid personality disorder is um, marked uh, by a family called a schizophrenia family and schizoid is the most um, innocuous version of that that means that you know generally the ability to feel extremes in emotions or even the normal emotions um, these people tend not to have that so they have a very cold and frigid approach towards life they do have normal emotions they do have feeling feelings and need for attachment with other people but then they're not always able to express that um, and that's marked with um, unusual thinking also uh, you know thinking that has um, no grounds in reality so for example if you're a schizoid personality uh, person you and they tend to be generally uh, be introverts uh, and uh, they like to uh, be on their own uh, being alone and they think of uh, things that other people don't um, for example um, it could be a fact that um, you have a, a weird explanative uh, theory about um, w how it rains and um, so these people can create theories out of things um, that do not exist for example every fifth day um, of the week um, sun shines a little bit brighter than the rest of the week and they might not have um, no evidence for that um, and if you have if you believe in things that you do not have evidence for um, then this thinking is not normal at least in compared comparison with average person um, and that would uh, be one sign um, remember it's not exhaustive description of the personality type uh, but generally it's marked with anhedonia not able able to feel all the um, emotions um, and then um, unusual thinking um, schizotypal personality disorder is almost uh, similar with varying degrees of uh, same um, s odd behavior and thinking uh, in general when you see these people um, they can be turned into odd and eccentric um, you would know that they're a little bit different than other people and based on their body language the way they speak and the way they dress um, the way they interact with people and uh, so everyone who is a little bit or an eccentric I know that it's a very loose definition but you know in generally this is why they're clustered in such a way now uh, there is the second one um, which is extreme uh, instability in emotions so at one point you are um, out of bounds you're happy there is called the hypomania phase um, especially with the bipolar disorder um, that means that you can 
you have extreme uh, displays of emotions um, and no um, middle or mediocre line. So you're either extremely happy or you're extremely depressed and sad uh, to the point where you want to commit suicide. Uh, and that's a certain hallmark feature of um, a personality disorder called bipolar uh, disorders. Um, so and then, then there is antisocial personality disorder. Um, they do not uh, like to be uh, associated with people. They tend to be very critical of other people. Uh, they're very unpredictable. Um, antisocial disorder is also a predictor of uh, criminal behavior and psychotic behavior. So m many of these people um, who are in jail. Um, uh, at some point in their life, uh, if they have been evaluated for that, they definitely have antisocial personality uh, disorder. And um, then we have the borderline personality disorders. Um, well, Sanya, it's characterized as dramatic cluster because people are unable to uh, cope up with their emotions and the expression of these emotions. Um, so they're either extremely happy you know they're laughing and they're screaming and they're partying and um, on the other side um, they are so depressed that they want to commit suicide there's nothing in life um, so this is why when we see uh, dramas and movies and soap operas um, you know they overreact in situations and make it overly emotional uh, sometimes it can also be referred to as I mean it's, it's not um, it's not a scientific statement, but you know, in comparison, uh, women generally have, um, you know, they're more likely to be um, categorized into this cluster. Um, they're extremely emotional. You know, um, they tend to express themselves uh, more often than men. Uh, so you know, they they can be termed as more dramatic and unpredictable uh, than men on average. So that it's it's not a um, it's not a statement that um, blankly applies to everyone. Um, Saad, just uh, hold your th um, thought and you know, I'll answer your question um, briefly. You know, I'll just uh, end this. And then we have histronic personality disorders, and that is said to be the celebrity disorder. You know, there are people who always want attention on them, and if they do not get attention, you know, they get extremely mad and uh, unhappy about this, and you know, they cannot. Um, be on their own um, and you know they require consistent praise and uh, um, applauding from others to feel good about themselves um, narcissistic order a disorder is um, is a very common uh, disorder in which people think of them as the best um, and you know they're very unhappy if people do not comply with their requests um, and they're very abusive in their relationships uh, from others they want others to do things for them and they almost never do anything for anyone um, except they uh, require acknowledgement for that. Uh, finally, to the uh, last cluster, the cluster C, uh, we have uh, the anxious and fearful behavior. Um, so these people are extremely afraid of things and they are always thinking uh, about something bad uh, happening to them. Now, one is the avoidant personality disorder. Um, in th this personality disorder, people tend to avoid um, any personal contact or any friends um, out of the fear that they are inadequate uh, for their relationships. They think that other people will have a bad opinion about them. Um, they would think that they, they are not good enough uh, and people would think that um, they are not good friends. and based on this unfounded fear they do not even initiate contact with others um, i mean it's normal that people do get rejected at times you know not everyone is going to like you and not everyone is going to hate you but then in these people they have extreme fear of rejection um, and that makes them avoid human contact at all dependent personality disorder um, is a personality disorder that's marked um, by our um, tendency of uh, thinking ourselves as unable to cope with our own um, situation and we need someone else to depend on. Um, so that can happen that, you know, if you you cannot um, take care of yourself, someone has to do that. And if that someone um, is not available, we start thinking of ourselves as um, at the end of our life and, you know, there is no way out of that. Um, so this dependency on someone else um, is called the dependent personality disorders. Now, finally, we also have the impulse, uh, obsessive compulsive personality disorder. Um, that can generally happen to people um, who are extremely religious and rigid. 
um, and there's no black and uh, there's no gray area so either things are absolutely right or either they're absolutely wrong uh, and everything has to be done in a specific order so sometimes it happens that people uh, people think that you know their hands are dirty and they keep washing it to the point that you know their hands are so dry and they're almost bleeding but they they cannot get rid of the idea that um, they do not have to necessarily do it over and over and over again um, so if they think about a thought and um, then they cannot get rid of that thought uh, from out of their brain uh, so normally what people do is that you think about something and you know they evaluate the statement and they work uh, on the idea or they forget the idea or they ignore it for the time being and do something else but people with obsessive compulsive disorder is that they dwell on the idea and sometimes they cannot sleep because they're only thinking about that one idea and they cannot get it out of their hands um, and that that is one of the hallmarks for the obsessive compulsive disorders now that we have these five uh, personality disorders um, there are a couple of others um, in uh, diagnostic and statistical manual that I would like to briefly share with you uh, and MMPI 2 actually categorizes uh, you in one of those uh, disorders so if you can go and look at the new screen do you see the first one which is the hypochondriasis no Sanya you can only be in one of the clusters at one time I mean there are multiple um, diagnoses also um, but they are usually not from different clusters all right so um, one of the things and that's predominantly uh, the female um, disorder um, on average and like I said so hypochondriasis is um, basically the complaints and that tend to focus on your abdomen and back and the problem is that you know people complain that they have um, pain in those areas but there is no medical evidence for that um, so if uh, a doctor checks you he finds no uh, reason for you to complain about these things everything the reports are normal the blood work is okay and there is no pain in those um, areas when you touch them but just keep complaining about that um, and that is and the origin of that is um, your mental discomfort um, and you could keep complaining about that so you might have actually probably noticed that in a female they're always uh, complaining sometimes you know they tie their head and they say oh my head is hurting um, and actually there's nothing wrong with the head the only fact is that they're disturbed about something and they don't like something um, so that would be one um, very common um, and simple at the same time um, instance of um, how hypochondriasis might look like yes back pain is one of them uh, Sania but that could also be because of overweight um, and that could be the real issue also so you have to establish if that's a real thing or not um, second common is the depression um, again uh, women tend to have more depression than men um, because of different reasons and also the biological makeup them um, we have several studies and literature and it's an established fact now um, then we have hysteria um, that means that you know people are in uh, poor physical health um, and there are five different um, scales for that um, shyness cynicism headaches and neuroticism you know they have their own scales and and the test actually evaluates for that um, then we have the psychopathic deviate these are people who generally are the criminals you know they have uh, history of social alienation and self alienation and things like that um, then we have a scale and uh, this, this is actually not a scale that we calculate but we generally f tend to find out um, the strength of masculinity and femininity in people so that means that if you're a stereotypical um, strong um, arrogant um, and risk-taking male or you are generally uh, a female who tends to behave like one that means very shy or um, modest um, and um, very stability oriented uh, person now then we have the paranoia we discussed about that that's the unfounded fear of things um, and you know how it might hurt you we also have psychasthenia uh, which is an old term for the obsessive compulsive disorders 
Um, then we have schizophrenia. We briefly discussed about the cluster A disorders um, on sch sch schizoid and schizotable disorder. Um, it, the final stage for this um, is the schizophrenia. I mean, these disorders um, have a chance to develop into schizophrenia, but um, evidence is there that uh, not always that this might be the case. Um, hypomania is uh, extreme excitement. And that happens generally in bipolar disorders, um, but is not limited to that. So what happens is that you have uh, shaky hands, you become very excited, um, you have unstable moods, um, and you have flights of idea, you appreciate very weird and um, uh, unpragmatic ideas, um, and you behaviorally you're always moving, um, and uh, you cannot control your emotions. And that's the same with your irritability and um, grandiosity. Finally, we have social introversion, and that's not a disorder, by the way. I mean, you could uh, be on the introvert side or the extrovert side, so that does not tell you anything. Uh, but it certainly um, no uh, lets the psychologist know that you know you you prefer to uh, have a small group or one-to-one -one talk um, as opposed to extroverts. So these are these ten skills that uh, MMPI actually. Um, assesses you on um, and based on uh, these three clusters you could be one of them so now there's so many other things and again I could possibly tell you about um, the psychopathologies but this was an overview of um, how we think about uh, mental disorders these days um, what we can do about that um, how to learn to cope with those things and uh, what are the medicine that we can take um, how do we uh, use therapies like CBD and DPD? That is going to be another uh, lesson that we're going to be studying soon. Um, but for now, what I want you to take away is um, the understanding of what is MMPI 2, the test. Um, what are uh, the internalizing and externalizing uh, disorders? The three clusters of personality disorders the nomothetic and ideographic approach um, of um, psychodiagnostics and i want you also to look at this presentation um, that i shared um, on the web page that i have uh, also uh, look at the videos that i sent you and now i can take all the questions so i believe sadhu had a question so i can just go ahead and unmute you Well, that's not entirely true, Saad, that all of these disorders are always in women. For example, men tend to um, have uh, substance disorders like drug abuse and alcohol abuse um, and violent crimes. This is why 99% um, or I would rather say 99.99% of .99 people in jail are men. Uh, men tend to take... Uh, more uh, drugs men are more involved in alcohols they are generally uh, found uh, to be offensive criminals they are also the majority of uh, deviant um, behavior people um, um, one of the explanations for that is that the um, biochemical processes are in men are different from females for example men have 17 times more testosterone levels that are um, the cause of um, aggression in men um, in comparison to females. Um, so if you have 17 times higher testosterone level, then you're certainly um, bound to re act in a way that is m more aggressive comparatively. Um, so it's not common that, you know, women have... I mean, women have their own kind of... Um, or on average, what we know from data is that women ha tend to have more internalizing disorders like depression and anxiety, um, um, sometimes inability to cope with uh, emotions, um, and thus we will have the borderline uh, personality disorder, and then we have hysteria. Um, we used to have something um, in 18th century that used to call it female hysteria. So, you know, you know, they get out of bound and start screaming and yelling. Um, but we know for the fact that men can do that also. Um, so it's, it's not very... Um, it's not a nice way of putting things that, you know, disorders can be male and females, even though we can say that there's a predisposition um, or differences in uh, reporting of this disorders in, uh, in terms of gender. Of course, Sonia, you know, 
uh, men can have depression also um, and this is why this might be interesting um, that uh, females are more likely to commit uh, or try to commit suicide um, than men like f they they try four times more than men but men succeed uh, four times uh, more in comparison with females so if a man tries to commit suicide he's likely going to kill himself but if a female does that um, she's going to survive uh, more than a man does because they use methods that are not lethal well that could be one explanation amara um, men generally are very ashamed and embarrassed about the fact that they do not have social status so if you look deeply into that um, what happened is that you know men have a huge responsibility um, or at least the societal or cultural expectations from them that they have to succeed in life you know they have to marry they have to take care of their kids and when they fail to do that um, or let's say you know society makes it harder for them to do that um, then they're extremely uh, unhappy about that and uh, one of the ways um, that men react in this situation is to become violent and do something about that uh, this is why we have a huge problem now um, that you know men tend to um, use drugs like ice and cocaine and things like this to uh, avoid thinking about this unbearable situation where uh, they cannot uh, face the consequences or realization that they do not um, live up to societal goals and this is why you know when your parents want you to be become doctor and engineer you cannot become one uh, people tend to think of that as failure and embarrassment for their parents and themselves and many of them commit suicide i believe everyone have seen three idiots um, and that's a very shocking situation so i know one of these guys in university of faslabad and he actually shot himself um, he was a chemical engineer because he was failing a course uh, with a specific teacher for many times and he just wrote a suicide note that you know i'm very sorry and i failed my teacher and my parents um, and then he simply shot himself um, and it's very unfortunate um, and sad that in a culture where people should be celebrated and evaluated based on their natural talents and gifts uh, we are actually making standards for themselves um, and ourselves and evaluate people in the light of their achievements uh, and not their individual differences um, so it does not matter if you're an engineer or a doctor um, the goal for any society should be um, giving opportunities to people to fulfill their natural potential and respect people based on who they are and not based on who um, they become uh, let's take question one by one um, yes sad that's true you know m for men uh, it's a sign of weakness uh, or at least that's that's the perceived view of that you know men see as a sign of weakness to show their emotions they generally do not cry um, that's that's an interesting story actually and I can share you my personal experience with that which is that when I was in Sweden and uh, we were watching a movie actually with our Swedish uh, friends you know, that included um, different females and they were very shocked about the fact that you know in Indian movies why do men cry um, and now you can see the difference between different cultures that you know for us it's common um, that you know it's okay to cry once in a while if you're a man and for them it never happens and this this is some kind of sign of weakness um, so this is generally perceived um, that you know men do not cry and that's what we are told at home uh, and I have no reason why men should not cry if they're feeling extreme pain and emotional distress um, well you should not only be crying about the situation you should do something to fix that and that applies to both men and women but generally if, if you do cry that there's nothing wrong with that for example if your parents died or if one of your best friends um, is in an accident or something like that why wouldn't you cry I mean that would be extremely weird if you did not so it's absolutely normal to do that uh, and this is why uh, women tend to live a little bit longer also um, because um, they generally have very good um, uh, awareness of their own emotions they tend to cry and share and this is why they're more likely to seek psychological help in comparison with men well, most of my clients uh, tend to be um, females uh, and uh, this is why generally they are more aware of their situation than men are not which is unfortunate no sad i do not agree you know everyone feels pain it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman sure it does sanya um there's certainly um societal 
uh, expectations from different people and if you fail to achieve those that you will be a little bit embarrassed and your family and your friends actually play a huge role in that which is unfair um, and I think many of the problems caused by uh, society are a lot more uh, serious than our own